2021, the Cato Institute, uh, with the help of Open Doors USA, did a study on a people group. And uh, they took this people group and they identified some things that were happening. And they saw that 360 million people in this people group lived in persecution. This is 2021. 5,600 of these people were murdered. 6,000 of these people were detained or imprisoned. 4,000 were kidnapped. And over 5,000 facilities and buildings that were associated with these people groups were destroyed in 2021 alone. The people group that we're talking about here and the people group that they sought after and, and were researching were Christians. Bible-believing Christians. Now, that's for us, that's hard because sometimes we go, whoa, what in the world? This is the United States, man. We don't even face persecution or, or those kinds of things. We don't see people being murdered or detained for their Christianity in the United States. We don't see buildings being destroyed or churches being destroyed. Maybe occasionally you'll see some rare thing here or there, but not like this. All those stats I just read you were within one year in 2021 alone all around the world. And yet when we look at the Bible, I, I, so when I see problems in culture and I see these things that frustrate me or that bother me or that, that really get at me, I have to go to the Bible to see what the Bible says. And this is the answer that the Bible gives me. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 that blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. We'll get to that in just a minute. We've been in the series called the Beatitudes, and today we're wrapping up this series, and some of you guys are like, man, this, is, this has been such a wonderful series. For me, uh, personally, as, as we digest these things, and we process these things as a pastoral team, and then we get to preach the messages, God does work in our heart, amen? And so we, we just thank God for what he's been doing in my own life through this series. I hope it's been beneficial to you guys, um, and today is the last one. But the Beatitudes are in Matthew chapter 5. And it's the, the blessed are, or the blessed are, depending on how you want to say it. And, uh, but those, that captures eight different things that we've been going through the last eight weeks. And, and this is number eight. This is the last part of that passage. But the Beatitudes are simply this. They're the attitudes and characteristics of those who are like Christ and inherit his kingdom. So when we look at this passage, we say, what is Jesus trying to tell us here? What in Matthew chapter 5 are we trying to get across? It's basically Jesus saying, hey, listen. You want, to be like, you want to be like me and you want to inherit my kingdom? Do these things. Grow these things in your heart. Make these things a part of your life. And so they're the attitudes and characteristics. And so we've talked about poor in spirit and mercy and humble and all those other ones that stacked up. And then we get to this eighth one. And sometimes you'll see eight or nine, but we, most people combine these last two because they're in the same vein, the same thought. We get to Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. It goes, it, it reads this way. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. We see that blessed are those who are persecuted for his righteousness. Blessed are those who are people who insult you, when they insult you, when they persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil things against you, right? And yet we go to these other stats that I read earlier, and we see that we don't see that kind of persecution. When I see the word persecution, I go immediately to what I, what I talked about earlier, the violence or the things that are, that are life-altering. And persecution is that. When we ask the question, what is persecution? It is that. It is physical harm. It is buildings being destroyed. It is an assault on something or somewhere, right? And when we're talking in this case, we're talking about people that believe in Jesus. Persecution, an appropriate definition of that is physical harm. That can be persecution and is persecution. But there's another side to persecution that we sometimes miss. And we're going to talk about both of these interchangeably. So I don't want you to get too heady or confused or whatever on this word. Don't get caught up on it. But persecution is also emotional or psychological harm done to you. There's a lot of nonviolent ways that you can be persecuted. And when I say some of these, maybe you in the workplace, maybe you in your family, maybe you with your friend group, you'll go, oh, yeah, that's, so that's persecution? That's what that means? And by no means, and just this, as a caveat, by no means am I minimizing or downplaying any types of severe persecution that our brothers and sisters in the Lord across the, United, across the world not often in the United States, but sometimes, are experiencing. 
That's not what it is. It's not like, well, you know, persecution is really just this little thing. I'm definitely calling out the big persecution as well, right? Because Christians are being persecuted. But think about it in this way, in our context. Antagonizing. You might face some antagonism. People poking at you. You Bible thumper. You little Jesus freak, right? I don't know. People might, people might say other words that, and attach nastier words to it when they aim their sights at you. They may antagonize you. Oh, you believe in that stupid book, huh? Oh, you're going to live your life by that, right? That's poking, that's prodding, that's antagonism. That's persecution. Ostracism. You get pushed out. You get ostracized. You get left out of something. So, oh, well, we're not going to invite you to that because, well, you're, you're a goody two-shoe. You're the Christian kid, so you're not coming, right? You say, well, that, that doesn't feel very good. Rejection is a part of that ostracism often, but rejection can happen at any time. You go to talk to somebody. Oh, I don't, I don't care what you have to say. No, 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 I don't believe what you have to, I don't believe what you're saying, Let's forget it, and they reject you. That's part of nonviolent persecution. Slander, gossip, people talk about you, oh yeah, those Christians, man, this is my favorite one, those Christians, they're hypocrites. Those Christians, they, they like to talk and, and sit in their churches and, and talk about how good they are, but really they're just nasty people. That's persecution, right? Intimidation. He says, oh, you know, they're, they're going to come after you and intimidate you. How about legal threats or restrictions? Man, when we went through this COVID era, right, and you, you, can, you can argue with me all you want, but you'll never change my mind because when weed shops are allowed to be open and churches are allowed to be closed, there's a little bit of persecution going on there with legal pers- per restrictions and, and laws that happen. I'm just telling you, that's exactly what happened, right? And we face those kinds of things, but sometimes we miss them as persecution. Sometimes we don't see them as persecution, But here's the key. We have to ask this question because Jesus makes a really good distinction between just persecution and persecuted because of righteousness. And this is an important thing that we have to see because persecution on itself, by itself, does not make you inherit the kingdom of heaven, does not give you some kind of reward that we're talking about. But persecution because of righteousness does. So what is the difference? The distinction is this. Jesus, when he talks about it is talking about being persecuted for doing what is right. Persecuted because of righteousness. See, oftentimes this is where we get mixed up because sometimes we just play stupid games and win stupid prizes and then we say, well, we're being persecuted. No, we're not. You're just doing dumb stuff, right? And sometimes when we make mistakes and do dumb stuff, we have consequences of that, over that. And sometimes we have to walk in those consequences. That's not persecution, right? It may feel like it. You may have, wow, these people attack me. Well, stop doing dumb stuff, right? <laughs> but, yeah, I know, it's okay to laugh, right? But sometimes we, we feel like it's, we're being persecuted, but we have to look at this and go, why am I being persecuted? Am I being persecuted because of the things that I have done? Or am I being persecuted because of righteousness? Because it's different. It's different. This is what unrighteous behavior is, is what somebody called unblessed, and, un- and the consequences of our failures, right? But righteous behavior, being persecuted because of righteousness means this, that we're living in God's will, that we're being counterculture, because as soon as you say yes to Jesus, you separate yourself from the current culture and you live by the standard of God's word, that's counterculture. You seek Jesus with all your heart, seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And, and they come at you because of the behaviors and actions are aligning with his will. That's what it means to be persecuted because of righteousness. Not because you're digging your heels in, not because you did dumb stuff, not because of that, but because that you say, this is what is right, and I'm going to go after what is right. I'm going to align my heart with Jesus, and I'm going to do what he says. And it's oftentimes, and almost every time, that brings attacks and persecution and trials and tribulations. That's the difference between being persecuted and being persecuted because of righteousness. There's some good news in this, and there's some not so good news in this, and I'll start with the not so good news first, is persecution is promised. I know, you're like, oh, that's awesome, you know, yay, let's follow Jesus, you know. Um, We have this understanding that we're going to follow Jesus, everything's going to be okay, we're going to follow Jesus, and all the sins of all the things I've done go away. All this is true, right? We, We get a clean slate. Christ forgives us, we move forward. But it does not say that everything is peachy, unicorns and rainbows and clean sailing right from now on. 
It doesn't say that. It actually promises the exact opposite. Jesus goes on in John chapter 15. This is exactly what Jesus says in John 15 and 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. <laughs> That's Jesus talking. That's not me. John 16, Jesus says again, John 16, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. I like that. But check this out. In the world you will have tribulation. You will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Second Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, and he writes this to Timothy as Timothy's struggling as a young pastor and, and, and trying to figure out how to lead and, and grow. And, and Paul writes these really encouraging words to, cite, to Timothy in his second letter in chapter 3, verse 12. He says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Go get him, Timothy. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you're doing a good job, but just know that you're going to live for Christ, you're going to be persecuted. Right? So we see this pattern. Not only do, do we see this pattern with Jesus tells us, when you persecute, you're going to be persecuted if you follow righteousness. He says it again, and he says it again, and I don't have all the time to quote it. And then you got Paul writing and reiterating these people that, that are founding the New Testament church. Hey, if you're going to try and live that lifestyle, people are going to come at you. If you're going to try and live righteous, you're going to be persecuted. Right? And they're telling you that. And he says in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus infers this, but he says the prophets who are persecuted before you, some of those prophets include Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Now, you, you Bible readers, you'll know that those are some big-time prophets. Jeremiah is a big-time prophet. Isaiah is a big-time prophet. Isaiah carries a bunch, a bunch of prophecies that he talks about Christ being the Savior that were fulfilled when Christ came. And yet with Jeremiah, with Isaiah, with Ezekiel, you know what happened? They were persecuted. They were ostracized. They would say things on God's behalf and live righteous, and people would attack them. They would say, I don't want any part of you, even to the point where Isaiah felt like he might have been all by himself. And he was yet preaching and speaking the prophecy of, that God had given him, and he was ostracized and rejected and pushed out. The disciples made a choice when they followed Jesus. They left their nets, they left their tax collecting, they left the things that they were doing before, and they said, hey, I need to go follow Jesus with everything I have. And it was a great ride for three and a half years. Imagine the disciples rolling around, and Jesus is he healing people, and they're going all over Israel, and they're doing amazing things, and even some the disciples are even getting to be a part of that and do some amazing things, and they're watching the Savior. And then they get to that point where they lose, in their mind, everything. That Jesus, who is sinless, who is faultless, but he's living that lifestyle, he's walking with God, is persecuted. Persecuted to the point of death. And we have disciples, 11 of them at the time, because Judas betrayed him, but we have 11 of these disciples left. And they're going, well, this was our whole world. So they made a choice. They watched the guy that they were following be persecuted all the way to death. But guess what else they watched? That same Savior raised from the dead three years later. And they decided right there, they decided right there, and it took a little bit, some of them a little bit longer. Thomas actually had to feel the holes in the hands, right? Because he's like you and me, he doubts things, right? But after that, they made a choice to say, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow this man, God incarnate Jesus, and unto death. These guys didn't go, well, I'm going to be a celebrity pastor, and I'm going to land on preachers with sneakers, and everybody's going to love me, and I'm going to write some books, and everybody, it's going to be really cool, and I'm going to walk into my place as the Christian, and, and the light will shine before I go in the door. Everybody will bow, and it'll be awesome. Now, these guys knew exactly what they were getting into because Jesus had already prepped him. He already told him, you're going to face some stuff. And everybody besides John is martyred, goes to their death in order to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew something about persecution. Persecution still exists today, right? I just told you some stats from that, from that group from the, the Cato Institute that was doing some research. This is another one I wanted to show you. It says Christians 
are the single most widely persecuted religious group in the world today. Now, it's not flashy, it's not, it's not cool, so you don't see it on mainstream media a whole bunch, but Christians are the single most widely persecuted religious group in the world today, with one source estimating that 75% of acts of religious intolerance are directed against Christians. Christians. See, we don't, we don't think about that, we don't see it as much. But the Bible says that he promises us that persecution's coming. Right, and unfortunately, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ in Egypt who get persecuted all the way to death. Buildings destroyed. Hey, thank, thank God, and this is not said flippantly or lightly. I, I say this with all sincerity. Thank God that we do not see that kind of persecution in the United States yet. But it doesn't mean that when you follow Christ, that stuff doesn't happen. You know, I grew up in, a, I grew up in some some church settings and some things like that. And my dad could tell you some better ones. Um, he, he's got to tell you about a time where they, they staged uh, something in their youth group. I don't even want to say it because it just scares me anyway. But um, there's a time where, where people would try and scare you in. And oh, if, a, if a gun was put in your face right now, would you say yes to Jesus or not? Right? And, and the Russians are coming and all that. I'm not that old. You guys are. But, um, but, we had, <laughs> but we had some of those moments, you know, like, what would you do if it was right there, you know? And I was thinking like to myself as a kid that grew up on the Oregon coast in Forest Grove, I'm like, no, ain't nobody putting a gun in my face for Jesus. You know, like there's nothing, right? And so persecution was hard for me to understand. But there were times where I was ostracized. There were times where I'm put out. And maybe that's you right now. Maybe in the workplace, you're going through some stuff and somebody knows that you're a Christian. Somebody knows what you believe. Somebody knows how you walk and how you live and they choose to put you out. They reject you. They ostracize you. They make fun of you. They mock you. Maybe that's in your friend group, right? Maybe it's in your family and they leave you off an invite list and it stings a little bit. Let me just tell you one thing real quickly that I've learned. I'm not that old, but I've learned a few things. And this is the one thing that I've learned. Sometimes I want to be left off that invite list. Man, it might, it, it might hurt and it might feel like rejection. But listen, if you're just going to go out and party with the buddies and get drunk and do things that you shouldn't do, please leave me off the invite list. If you're going to sit around with your friends and gossip and talk trash about somebody else, hey, please leave me off the invite list. If you're going to go out there and you're going to say all kinds of stuff and you're going to go to the water cooler and you're going to watch shows that you shouldn't watch just so you can be accepted by the world and fill your mind with a bunch of garbage, hey, listen, please, leave me off that invite list. You catch what I'm saying? If you're going to get on that Instagram or that computer and you're going to see those ads and they're going to call you in to look at something that you shouldn't, guess what? Leave me off that invite list. Because it's better to be rejected and blessed in heaven than it is to be accepted by this world. So leave me off that invite list. But too often, we want to be invited. Too often, we want to be accepted. And it's hard for us to figure that out. In John, we read that earlier, and I said I'd come back to it. It says, if, the world, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. May I just give you something before we move on? If you aren't being persecuted, maybe the enemy isn't that worried about you. If you aren't being persecuted, maybe the enemy isn't that worried about you. That's a scary place to be, folks. I welcome it. See, my, I didn't always. But now I say, man, I want to stand in the face of that. I want, I want you, the enemy, to throw anything that he can at me. Go for it. Bring it. And I'm not saying that in an arrogant, prideful way or a taunting way. What I'm saying is that when Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. So because if I'm being persecuted, then that's a big old ding, ding, ding winner sign that I must be following after God with all my heart. Because if I'm following after God with all my heart, the Bible says you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations, you're going to be persecuted. And so if you're not being persecuted, if you're not being ostracized, if you're not being left off a list somewhere, then maybe the enemy just isn't that worried about you. And he knows that he's already got you, and you're already of the world, and so it doesn't matter. Leave them alone. Let's go after some people that really want to live for Jesus. That's not a fun thought to think, right? Right? It's not like, oh, yay, you know, like, let's follow Jesus and let's be persecuted. But I said there was some good news, and this is the good news. We call the gospel the good news because there's one who understands persecution in a way that you and I 
hopefully will never understand it and can't understand the magnitude of it. God looked at his creation and he said, hey, these people have sinned. They have messed it up. They have separated us. They have separated that relationship between God and his people. And he said, that's not okay. I can't do this. I want them to be close to me. I want them to have relations. So they sent, he sent Jesus, his son, who was fully God and became fully man to walk on this earth, to be mocked, to be persecuted, to be made fun of, to be ostracized, to be rejected, to be beaten, to be scorned, to be abused, all for what? All so that you and I could be made right. That's what Jesus offers. And it's more than we deserve. Jesus says yes to that shame and that scorn and that punishment and that persecution so that you and I can live eternal life, so that you and I can have relationship with God, so that you and I can live a life abundantly here on this earth. And so we look at Jesus who has already foreseen this and knowing the plan. He says, hey, listen, blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness because there's a special reward for you. There's a special reward for you. Man, that's some good news. That is some good news. Our reward is both now, because we have the remission of sin, and we're gonna come to the communion table in a few minutes, and we're gonna remember what Christ did in that that time where he was persecuted and killed for our sins. So our reward is great. Our reward is now. We have forgiveness of sin, remission of sin, a fresh start. We have an ability to see and know and hear and understand the word of God, to hear his spirit, to be in communion with him, to have a relationship with him. That's a reward right now. And and Jesus said there's one coming who is going to be a comforter, a comforter. We talk about the Holy Spirit, and sometimes we throw around that third person of the Trinity, and we don't really understand it, and, and you know, it's Halloween last week, so it's like, oh, is he a guy in a sheet, or, you know, like, what, what is it? Like, what is the Holy Ghost? What is the Holy Spirit? And we don't have a good handle on it, but here's what it is. It's the presence of God living inside of you, and Jesus promised that to you, that when you say yes to him, the Holy Spirit comes and resides within you, and he's a comforter. In Isaiah chapter 11... I'm gonna ask the worship team to come forward and prepare for our communion time. But in Isaiah chapter 11, it talks about the spirit of the Lord. It talks about the roots of Jesse. But he's specifically talking about the man that is full with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the Lord. And and you read chapter 11 in Isaiah, verse one, two, and three, and you see these seven different things that are a a characteristic of what the Holy Spirit, the spirit-filled man, the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to us. Right down there in the middle, there's wisdom and some other ones, but right down there in the middle is a word in the Hebrew called gubura. And in Latin, we, they would translate it as fortitudo. And in English, we would translate it fortitude. This gift of the spirit, fortitude, means a strength or a force, a bravery, a courage, a valor. When you ask the Lord into your heart and you accept the Holy Spirit, we go through persecution, we go through trial, we go through things that are pressing us on all sides, but yet we know our eternal reward is there. But check this out. The Holy Spirit also brings fortitude. Joseph Rickaby says it this way. He says, describes it as a willingness to stand up for what is right in the sight of God, even if it means accepting rejection, verbal abuse, or physical harm. The gift of fortitude allows people the firmness of mind that is required both in doing good and in enduring evil. When you say yes to the Holy Spirit, you say, well, you said that, the, that persecution was promised. I did, and that's what Jesus says, right? But we know that he has left with us on this earth the Holy Spirit that resides in us, that brings a fortitude to us during these times of persecution and trial, a courage, a valor to stand up, the firmness of mind. Man, I love the way this, this, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but this is what I need when I'm going through some trials and some tribulations, some persecution. When I'm getting left off invite lists, when I'm getting rejected, when I'm getting ostracized, when people are saying, well, you're just a Christian kid. I don't want you at my house. And listen, you can be a pastor and they leave you out of a whole different category of stuff, right? Even church people leave you out of stuff. They don't want you to know what you're doing, right? And you get ostracized and you get left out. But here's it is right here. The Holy Spirit says, but hey, man, I got you. I'll comfort you. 
and I'll bring a fortitude. I'll bring a firmness of mind. I'll bring a strength and a valor in the time of rejection and ostracism and antagonism and all those things we talked about earlier. When I say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to do those things in me. That should be an encouragement to you. That should be good news to you. Jesus says this, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are those, right, in the, in the second half in verse 12, 11 and 12, blessed are you when people insult you, when persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Verse 12, check this out. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. I have to laugh because oftentimes when we're in the middle of persecution, we don't rejoice and be glad. But with the Holy Spirit, we can. We can rejoice and be glad in times of persecution. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the Holy Spirit, that you give us that fortitude, that ability to stand in the face of persecution, that ability to, to see things that are, that with trials and tribulations and things that are pressed on every side, Lord, and you give us the fortitude, the firmness of mind, the strength and the valor to stand in that, because on our own, you know that we couldn't do that. And God, I do pray for those Christians, our brothers and sisters around the world that are facing persecution. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them, that it would fill them, that Lord, as they're standing up for righteousness, that they're doing the things that you've called them to do to live in the right way, God, I pray that you would strengthen them, be close to them and comfort them. Lord God, as we go through things in our life here, Lord Jesus, God, the trials and tribulations, I pray that you would do the same, that you would strengthen us, you would give us a resolve like no other, Lord God, that you would give us a firm foundation, Lord, that we could stand up for what is right. And as we get pressed from our friend group or our family or our workplace or wherever it comes from, Lord God, when we face those things, God, I pray that you would remind us that that still small voice would be in our head that would be saying, yes, I have you and blessed are those who persecute you because they hated you because they hated me. And God, let us rejoice and be glad knowing that we're on the path, that we're seeking you first, that we're walking in righteousness and that we can rejoice and be glad when we face persecution and trials and tribulation. Help us, Jesus, in your name, amen. Amen. The worship team is, is going to play a song, and I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. And during this song, um, I'm going to have the gentleman come forward to administer the communion emblems. And what I'd ask you to do is at some point during this song, um, when, you feel, when you feel like you're ready, come forward and grab one of those communion and then hold it with you because we're going to take it together this morning. Um, so sometimes we take it on our own or whatever, but today, today we're going to do that together. Um, if you say, hey, well, I don't, I don't know if I can take communion. Here's what it takes to, to be able to participate in communion. Um, one is a right relationship with God, right? The Bible is clear with that, that we should be in a right relationship with God before we take communion and that all who are in that right relationship can take communion, right? So what does that mean? You say, well, I don't know. Am I in the right relationship with God? Have you said yes to Jesus as your Savior? Then please participate. That's it. That's a simple Right? If you say, hey, I don't, you know, I'm not ready for that. I'm not prepared for that. That's okay. Nobody's going to call you out. Nobody's going to point at you. Nobody's going to ostracize you. Right? But I want you to know that you're welcome to take communion with us um, if you made that decision for Christ. So let's sing and come forward for communion. We'll come back and take it together.